Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a crowd we have here today. Hey, Sue Ellen. I didn't see you come in. Hey, Pat. <laughs> and uh, welcome home, Alan and Linda. <laughs> He's been sheltering in place. <laughs> And while we're talking about Alan, uh, you may have noticed out on the table, and they're going fast, Alan, uh, you may have noticed a couple of books. I won't try and print, okay? Bet Sharukin and Millennium. Alan is, is an author and uh, and over the course of the past few years has written these two books. They are novels, and I guess the best way to describe it is that they are novels uh, based on scriptural fact uh, about end times and the millennium. I can tell you, I have read both of these books. Fortunately, I even got an early read on this one before it was actually published. Um, I found them to be not only entertaining, as novels should be, but filled with a lot of fact about, you know, what it is that's in front of us and um, and uh, how things could work out in, in, uh, in the end times. So Alan has been kind enough to bring a few uh, take-home copies. Um, I do believe we also have copies up in the library from before. And um, I just would uh, encourage uh, anyone who's interested to pick up a copy on your way out and uh, and enjoy them. But Alan, there aren't enough for the people who are going to want to read them. <laughs> yes. Good stuff, folks. I, I, I loved it. It, um, they were, they were really good. Okay, so, um, I think that uh, everyone has kind of noticed um, as they came in today that there were a lot more people wearing masks um, than uh, perhaps uh, previously were here. Um, coincident with um, changes in Gilpin County's restrictions on um, on reopening. Interesting, interestingly, Gilpin County is one of three counties in Colorado that have advanced in reopening stage um, and entered the protect your neighbor phase of reopening, which has um, somewhat fewer restrictions than the statewide restrictions. However, um, the mask mandate still applies and we feel uh, as though it's important for uh, everyone now that we here in Gilpin County have entered this new phase that uh, we kind of go through um, what all this uh, is about and how it applies to us as a church and how it applies to us individually uh, here in the church. First off, you notice that uh, I have taken my mask off. Uh, speakers and worship team, um, when they are speaking and worshiping, are not required to wear a mask. And so when you see that, you'll, you'll understand that uh, uh, why we're up here without our masks on. The mask mandate applies to all people with the exception of those with medical conditions and the following. 
uh, children 10 years old and younger are not required to wear a mask. Children two and under should not wear masks. Masks are required for those who are not exempt when entering or moving about in the church building. That means that when you have taken your seat or are standing for worship, um, <coughs> you may remove your masks. They're not required. You'll notice that the front row is a little further back than it used to be. Um, a part of the recommended guidelines, this is not a mandate, but a guideline, is that if you are sitting within 25 feet of the podium, in this particular case, it is recommended that you wear a mask even when seated. However, this is not a mandate, and it's important to understand that. Other general restrictions that have applied for a while, but um, we feel like we need to reinforce, is that <coughs> the church may not offer food or beverages of any kind on church property, nor can food or beverages be brought in to share. You may, however, bring your own food and beverage for yourself, but you may not share it. Okay. Um, And please use common sense, other common sense precautions that, uh, that we all know are important. First off, if you're sick, don't come to church. Now, I know we're all sick, but I'm talking about physical sickness. If you're sick, don't come to church. Wash your hands regularly. Use hand sanitizers. And please, here at the church, do not use the drinking fountain. Okay. Important in all of this is this, that all authority here on earth is given by God. As a matter of fact, the last in-person um, church service that we had here um, prior to the COVID lockdown, that's pretty much what the, what the entire <laughs> message was about that Sunday. All authority on earth is given by God, and he commands us in several scriptures that I know you all are familiar with, that we are to obey the laws issued by our governing authorities. But here is an important key. Our obedience is a matter of personal responsibility. And that's important for each and every one of us to think about. It's a matter of personal responsibility. And having said that, it's also important to realize that it being personal responsibility, it is not the church's responsibility to enforce these mandates here in the church. So don't think that there will be masked police running around here in the church enforcing. It's all up to us individually, right? Okay. Um, Jeff, have I missed anything? Okay. Um, any questions? Important, if you've got questions, please ask them so that we can all, all know we're doing the right thing here. Okay. So again, key here, you need to wear a mask when you come in, when you're moving about, as you're leaving. Um, try and maintain social distance, otherwise, all that stuff. 
And um, but let's worship the Lord, eh? So, other uh, announcements. Of course, uh, Tuesday, Women in God Service meets here at the church, 545. And I believe we're in Jude week four. Session two. Okay. All right. Session two. <laughs> okay. Wednesday, we have group Bible study uh, here at the church, 645. You know, we had 23 people here this past Wednesday. 23 people. Yay. <laughs> that always amazes me. I praise God for it. Um, so here at the church, 645 uh, and uh, via Zoom, and um, we'll be studying Revelation chapter 3. Now, Saturday, men's Bible study resumes, uh, 8 a.m. here at the church. We're going to be, be beginning a, what is for the men, a new study, um, we're going to be uh, studying spiritual warfare. This is the study that, uh, that the women of this church um, just finished a few weeks back. Um, men being somewhat different than women, you know, one of the things that's uh, <laughs> different is uh, men prefer videos <laughs> to reading. <laughs> <The> <laughs> I don't know why that is, um, but um, there are books. I've, uh, I'll be ordering them today, and we will have books for everyone who attends, but we're going to approach this for the men as a uh, video study, and if you want to read the book, uh, I encourage you to do so, uh, but the fact that there's a big fat book involved should not be keeping any of the men away is what I'm saying here because I've heard that before. I don't want to hear that again. <laughs> yeah, and it's a good one too, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, and it's an important one because we don't battle against flesh and blood, do we? It's the spirit realm. Boy, and if you want to learn more about that, talk to Alan Bonk sometime. I'll tell you what. Uh, now, yeah, we're going to be providing books for this men's study, but um, it can't be a men's breakfast and study like it has been in the past unless you bring your own. So men, bring your own food and your own coffee because we won't be able to have it here otherwise. All right. All right. <laughs> oh, Heaven's Angels. The CTK Motorcycle Club had a ride yesterday. Cool stuff going on there. Jenna and I were not able to participate because we don't have our licenses yet. Y'all can be praying for us for tomorrow and Tuesday as we go and take our courses and, and, and get our licenses. But I hear it was a really good time. Did you get a new picture? That is a new picture? Okay. I thought that was the one from before. Okay. Different faces. All righty. Um, <laughs> you don't have to wear masks while on these rides, <laughs> but you should wear helmets. <laughs> okay. Um, and one other announcement. Um, we are short of uh, one person in nursery duty. Okay, <laughs> it was short, one person in, nur in nursery duty, and, um, and so Kim is looking for another volunteer, um, and uh, I know that she's going to be going around s uh, soliciting folks individually, but uh, 
please, if you're interested in providing uh, one week a month in the nursery when we have little kids, uh, please see Kim about that. And living nativity. <laughs> yes. Um, CJ has been uh, leading us through pulling together this niv living nativity that we're going to be putting together uh, and, and doing um, a week or so before Christmas uh, right here at CTK. And I don't believe there is a need for more volunteers, but um, those of you who are involved in working uh, bear in mind, time is getting short. Um, if you've got costumes to complete, like me, um, or other things that you need to be doing to getting us, uh, help us get ready for the living nativity, um, let's put some focus on it because we're getting close, folks. Anything else on that, CJ? We start casting next week. Ooh. <laughs> I, I think, Tom, I, I think you're just going to have to be satisfied that you have Jesus in you. And, <laughs> and so when we look at you, we do see Jesus. Well, that's the other side of it. <laughs> yes. We should be growing up, though, and getting past the uh, uh, milk and toast, right? So, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> We're all saved people here, I believe. I don't know everybody, so I don't know that for sure. Um, but, you know, I, you know I've, I, I've seen that... Uh, when folks get saved, and, and this is not an uncommon thing, um, you know, very often people, once they get saved, build up their knowledge of God and have a real, grow to have a real firm grasp on what the Bible says, um, but don't necessarily, when they embrace Christianity, embrace Christ in their heart and their salvation in their heart, which is what's really needed to have a relationship with Jesus. And Jesus gives us the opportunity for that relationship through the Holy Spirit. When we're saved, we become baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about physical baptism here. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit entering us. But one of the things that often happens, especially with a brand new Christian, is we got all sorts of baggage in our hearts that don't leave a whole lot of room for the Holy Spirit. And sometimes... Um, we do in the beginning, but in the process of casting off the old man and, and all of that, we, we continue to put things into our heart that kind of takes away the room the Holy Spirit needs to be fully in charge of us, right? And, um... The Lord, I believe, is, uh, wants to remind us of that today and encourage us. So this is uh, in the message, Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Now it happened that while Apollos was away in Corinth, Paul made his way down through the mountains 
came to Ephesus and happened on some disciples there. The first thing he said was, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you take God into your mind only, or did you also embrace him with your heart? Did he get inside of you? We never even heard of that. A Holy Spirit, God within us? How were you baptized then? asked Paul. It's John's baptism. In John's, in John's baptism. That explains it, said Paul. John preached a baptism of radical life change so that people would be ready to receive the one coming after him, who turned out to be Jesus. And they were. Excuse me. If you've been baptized in John's baptism, you are ready now for the real thing, for Jesus. And they were. So as soon as they heard of it, they were baptized in the name of the Master Jesus. Paul put his hands on their heads, and the Holy Spirit entered them. From that moment on, they were praising God in tongues and talking about God's actions. Amen. Let's think about that as it applies to each and every one. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we just thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit to live within us, Lord, so that we can more and more and more pick up our cross and follow you every day and become more and more and more like you. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy because we know that often we just don't leave room for you here in our hearts. So Lord, today we thank you for the reminder and we, and we ask that you would keep on top of us about this that we would remove these stones from our heart, Lord, and allow you in and embrace you, not just in mind, but in our hearts. We thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for everyone that you brought out here today. We thank you for the message that you've given and for the message that you're about to give. We ask, Lord, that you would open up our ears, open up our hearts and our minds, that we may receive the message that you have for us today, each and every one of us individually and corporately as your body here in Gilpin County. We thank you, Lord. All the glory belongs to you. It's in Jesus' name that we come to you today. Amen. Amen. Put your masks on. Go say hello to somebody. Good morning, everybody. So glad you're here to join us today. Since you're already standing, why don't you join us as we lift our voices? Lift up Lord's name. Join us in some songs.
in a moment we will be like him. He will wipe our eyes dry, give us up to his side forever. We will be begin this morning I want to say something uh, 
I know a lot of times I, uh, from the pulpit, try to make jokes, and uh, sometimes they're directed at my wife, and that's not funny. Oh, I know, um, but uh, I want you to know that uh, yesterday we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary, and uh, and I love her more than anything in this world, and she's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me, apart from Jesus Christ. But uh, I, w I just want to apologize to her publicly for saying, you know, she's got eyes like fire or whatever, you know, so. Uh, she, she does. She does keep me in line. So anyway, with that being said, I love you. Okay. Let's pray. <coughs> Jeez, I don't know how I'm going to top this. Uh, a proper study of Revelation uh, isn't an exercise in mysticism or speculation. As we started last week, we found out that uh, if we do a systematic study of the book, Revelation is going to tell us the answers to a lot of things that we are questioning when we, when we read through the book. Uh, but we noticed last week that R John writes what he sees, not what he was told. And therein lies some of the confusion about what, is, what the book of Revelation is all about because he talks about he saw somebody like a son of man standing in the midst with go seven stars coming out of his hands and lampstands and, and all that. And that gets confusing. But then we read on and it tells us what, uh, what those stand for, what those mean. So I want us to uh, interpret the Bible literally unless it doesn't make sense. Okay? Um, and as we go through this book, I don't want it to be confusing. If, uh, if at times we get confused, come to me and tell me, I'm confused, what do you mean? And I'll say, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'm learning this as we go along. Uh, there's things that I didn't know about this book. You know, uh, Alan may have, uh, has more expertise in this area than I do. But uh, we're gonna get through this, and, and it's a blessing. And the thing that we have to remember, too, is that he, uh, Jesus says, blessed are you who read this book and adhere to it and heed, to, and heed it. So I want us to be blessed because we're going through the book of Revelation. I don't want us to stop because, oh, all things are happening in my life and things I don't want. You know, it's like that's not a reason to stop reading a book, especially a book of the Bible that we're afraid that Satan's going to attack us even more. I, I tell you what, he's not going to he's not going to win. No matter what what he throws at us, we are still God's children, and he's going to take care of us. Amen. All right. Good. Yes. We don't need to fear the enemy. We need to know who he is, but we need to not fear him because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. All right. So he's going to throw a bunch of stuff at us and we're going to kind of pull out our hair and wonder what the heck's going on. But uh, uh, it, it doesn't, it shouldn't shake us to the core. We shouldn't give up the ghost and just, just whatever. So, uh, so anyway, we had some unfinished business last week. Uh, so we ended it in Revelation 119, and it says, Therefore write the things which you have seen, the things that which are, and the things that will take place after these things. So John was told to write the things in three parts. The first part was write the things which you have seen. That's chapter one. And we'll look at that because everything that he sees from the beginning of uh, chapter one to verse 19 is the things that he saw. Okay? And we'll go through this some more and you'll, you'll see where it makes sense. And then the second part is write the things which are. The things which are, the, and as you, as you go through this, if you look at chapter 4 and it says, 
these things happen after these things. So we know that chapter 4 on are the things that which are going to happen, okay? Are you totally confused already? Are you? Okay. So, and then the third part is write the things which will take place after these things. That's chapters 4 to the end, 4 to 22, okay? Um, we, uh, we looked at, we're starting to look at the churches and uh, Jesus has got a message for each church. So um, chapter 1 is the first part of the book, the things which John had seen. But what did he see? Well, he saw his resurrected Lord in glory. He saw him like he's never seen him before. Um, he concluded with his appearance as like he'd never seen with hair like wool, like fire and or like uh, snow and eyes like fire and feet like bronze. <clears throat> well, the second part must start in chapter 2 since part 1 only included what John had seen up to verse 19. Okay, that's the first part. So now we're in the second part. And the second part tells us that chapters 2 and 3 are the things that are. Write the things that are. And as we go through this, we'll see that there's, we're going to look at the church age and the things that are going on now in the church age when it began at Pentecost, okay, like 30 A.D., and we're going to go all the way to, to, to the end. So if, um, if um, what's first church? Ephesus. If Ephesus was the first church, then Laodicea is the one that's going to end it. Good job, Jeff, keeping up with me. <laughs> Sometimes we should practice this, but I think that he's always looking at the slides and he can see where I'm, where I'm trying to go, so kudos to you, Jeffrey. Um, so the, the letters that uh, John gave to the church are for the letters that are for the church. They were for the church back then, 2,000 years ago, and they are for us today. Remember that this is alive and acting. It's active. This never goes out of style. It's never irrelevant. It's always going to tell us something that we need to hear today. And if you, as we go through this, you're going to find out that, wow, it, he's like talking like 21st century America. And it's amazing how God put all this together for literal translations and then for prophetic for or for future translations in the same passage okay you with me okay uh, so we're going to look at these letters and each one of them is based on the same uh, precept it's based on the same uh, structure he, he talks about who the church is where they're located he's got some uh Condom, uh, commendations for him. He's also got some condemnations for him. He gives him warnings. Uh, but these are real letters that were written by John. And we know that after Domitian died, he was led off the island. So he got to go to Ephesus and probably a couple of the other churches and pass these letters around. And so um, that's how they made their ways through that. Um, Jesus starts by talking about Ephesus as saying that they were standing strong against false teachers, against they were suffering persecution and so on. So these letters are specific, but they're also historical. Um, the, the church is, like I said, the churches or the letters for the churches are for the church even 2,000 years later. At every moment, somewhere in the world, we can find a church community experience the same issues as Ephesus or Smyrna. So as we go through this, you're going to be amazed at how, how it all just fits together and what, what God has done and what God is doing. So um, so let's start by noting the, the locations of these seven churches. I've got a map uh, it shows these uh, churches here. Starting in the left-hand corner, we see Ephesus, and then number two, Smyrna, and then Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. 
uh, the thing, and these are all churches that existed in uh, what we now know as Southwest Turkey. Okay, it was Asia Minor back then. Uh, they still have uh, relics of a lot of these places out there. When you go out there to Turkey, you can see a lot of these ruins that are still there. But what I want you to know is that the order that it's in, it goes, how does it go? Clockwise. Why does it go clockwise? To show a passage of time. Now, if there's somebody uh, who's really an astute historian, they'll point out that, well, the, mechanicals, the, the mechanical clocks weren't invented until the 14th century. Yeah, but we have sundials from 3500 B.C. And it goes the same way. It goes clockwise. It shows the movement of the earth with the sun, or the sun with the earth, or however it moves. <laughs> as we go around the sun, as the sun goes around the earth, um, so this is how the Romans understood time is in a clockwise manner. That's why uh, modern day clock builders made their clocks go clockwise, what we call clockwise, and it shows the movement of time. Okay, does that make sense? Now remember that because as we go from one to seven, we're going to see certain things that happen to each one of these churches, and it's, it's going to be a passage of time that, that we're going to look at that shows the difference between the first church and the seventh church, okay? Um, Jesus called this period of times that are are because they remain present day until we reach the end of the events of the end. Let me say that again. Jesus called this period the times that are because they remain present day until we reach the events of the end. So we are in the R movement right now. We are in the church age. And until the church age ends, that's when the prophecy really of this Bible, what we call prophecy, I mean it's all prophet, prophetic, but from chapters 4 to 22, the coming of Christ, that's what we'll be talking about. That's what trips up a lot of people, okay? So, um, so chapters 2 and 3 explain the events that must take place between the first century and the end times. Um, each letter represents a period of church history. In other words, the entire period of time of the church residing on earth is represented by these seven letters. And we have to remember that the seven stands for completion or 100% from God's perspective. So these aren't just seven churches in, in the thing. There is more churches than seven. But he's showing that seven is the number of completion. The 100% the of the churches are engrossed or embodied in all of this. Okay, does that make sense? You still with me? Okay, um, and we can represent the churches uh, with a simple graphic to show the church age. We start with Ephesus, and, and as you can see right there, it started at Pentecost, which was 30 A.D., and it runs until about a 100 A.D. Now, there's no way to know exact the exact time for all of this so this is kind of speculative on on our parts but uh, it, it, it's close to what happened and as we go through this we'll see events that happened during the church and we can apply it to history and we can see that oh at such and such a time in, in history that church was a, in existence okay so um, so the one through seven is the church age we'll start at Ephesus right there and then collectively, all seven letters or all seven churches represent the, the completion of God with his churches. Um, the thing that we didn't know up until, because when this was first pre presented as people, you know, 1900 years ago read this, they didn't have the, uh, the luxury of looking back. There was no hindsight involved whereas we have hindsight today looking back at what the churches are and what they went through okay so that's how we get to, to these uh these dates and and notice that the uh Ephesus is also called the apostolic church 
the, the apostles were still alive. John will be the last apostle that will be alive. He'll be killed. He, he's the last to, to survive. Um, so if Ephesus started the church, or the church age, then Laodicea ends it, which leads to the question, like, how and why is the church ending, and what does that mean for us? Um, that's where we get into the prophecy part of, of Revelation as we go on from chapters 4 on. What comes next? Well, the book of Revelation answers these questions for us. We don't need to try to speculate what, what it means. Revelation is going to tell us exactly what it means. Um, so, with that being said, another sh long introduction Let's move into the text, Revelation 2, chapter, Revelation 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, we, that we know what that is, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen, and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent." Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat at the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So he starts out by saying the church at Ephesus. It's a city. There was a city named Ephesus that was there. Uh, and like I said, he, he gives them condemnation commendations he can he uh, condemns them for some things uh, it's universal it's literal it's also prophetic because he we look at uh, the, the image of Christ when John sees him and he sees him in his glorified form the name uh, Ephesus means desired or desirable so it was a it was a seaport it was a, a major seaport in that time this is some of the ruins of it, and you, you can kind of see the blue back there, I believe, is the ocean. When Jesus says, repent of, and I'm kind of getting ahead, ahead of myself here, but you'll see that uh, towards the end of its life, it was on the seaport, but uh, uh, silt started building up because the, the, uh, the gosh, Yes, the people at Ephesus didn't heed what, what was being said, so, they, so Jesus did exactly what they said and started removing the lampstand or removing the church from its place. By the time it was all over, not only was it not on the water, it was miles inland because of their unwillingness to repent and change their ways. Um, we have to remember that uh, at this time there was still a lot, a lot of uh, people that said that they were apostles. They were coming into the church. They were trying to infil infiltrate the church. And that he says that you tried them, you tested them. Uh, a test of an apostle back then is if you said something and it came true, then you probably were an apostle or you, had, you could do miracles. But if none of those came true, you were not apostles, and that's what they said, that you, you didn't uh, put up with them. He also said that you endured. Um, and endurance is a key uh, element to sp spiritual maturity and eternal reward. Uh, James 5.11 says, We count these blessings. We count those blessed who endured who have heard the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that is, the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. 
in Hebrews 10.35 says, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. He was telling this church, you know what, you're doing a lot of good. You're persevering, you're holding on, you're trying to do what's good. But nevertheless, and this is one of the most chilling verses in the Bible, is you have left your first love. So what does that mean? Well, as a church, when you leave your first love, what other love becomes, comes before the love of Jesus? There's nothing. And we wonder how this could happen to a church that's being so diligent and enduring and fighting off false teachers. But he says it's, 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 you've left your first love. It's kind of like um, a teenager that turns from obedience to defiance. You know, that slow, that slow, gradual thing. And it, it happens slowly over time. You start thinking more or less that you can't tell me what to do. Um, they've left their first love in the sense that they've forgotten the early days of their relationship and have taken it for granted. And then he tells them, you remember from where you have fallen... Think about your missteps and repent of those past mistakes. The call to repent means to reconsider their p current path back up and move in a better way. If the Lord came to us and said that there was something that was going on in our lives and that you need to repent, we need to do that right away. Ephesus shows us what happens when you don't, when you don't act on what God is telling us to do. Um, Jesus is talking about one of the greatest threats to the missions of the church, the self-satisfied Christian. Being self-satisfied means finding satisfaction in the life that you have rather than in the life Jesus desires we have. When we become so complacent and so entrenched in what we have and who we are and what we're doing and Jesus has no place in that, we are wrong. We are being drawn away he has forgotten in, who's in charge, both in the church and of your life. So after you've left your first love, you've forgotten why you do this thing we call church. They start having ministries. They forget that God is all, in all of this. You start, uh, you start orphanages and everything. And I'm not saying that those in itself are bad, but when you start doing outreaches and you never talk about Jesus and Jesus is never involved in it, something is wrong. And that's what Jesus is telling this church at Ephesus. Okay? Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, groups that are going on and they'll have potlucks and horseshoes and everything like that. And that's all about fun and games and it's never about the gospel. So we have to be careful when we have things like this that, uh, that it includes Christ in everything that we do. Following Jesus is never boring or routine because Jesus won't let us find self-satisfaction. He wants us to grow. And like I said, he, he was so serious about this, he, he said that there would be a penalty if they failed to heed his warning, and that's where they, they did not repent and he removed the lampstand from them. Uh, there are a lot of things that we can desire in our church life, but we can't, we can't leave Jesus behind and expect to continue to serve him. But nevertheless, Jesus tells us that no matter what happened to the church in, in any one place, our personal relationship with Jesus doesn't change. We need to be busy about doing what he has called us to do from day one. Yes, there will be things that will be added and things that will be subtracted, but we need to make sure that Jesus is number one in that. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to read the verses in Acts, but they were talking about uh, the first church devoted themselves to breaking bread and the, the apostles' teaching, and, and they were worshiping together. And they were excited about it because they expected Jesus' return right then before their death. 
They expected Jesus to come back. Much the same way that today, after, you know, 2,000 years later, we go through this. Um, but things changed. It had to. The church had to exist in the world, which means it had to strike a balance between looking forward to an eternity with Jesus and living for today. We still have a job to do until Jesus comes back or calls us home. We have to make sure that uh, we are not being self-satisfied. We're not being self-serving in our church simply for its own sake. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Um, and then another sad part of this story is that the Lord allowed or sustained widespread persecution to enter the church and it broke the church free from its self-satisfaction. No longer was the church complacent and comfortable, nor could it find a place in Roman society. Instead, it went underground, and those who were not truly Christ quickly gave up the game. So the church split. Some people went underground, but then pretty soon they became friends with the Roman emperor and the Roman culture, and they just gave up. They just gave up. So like I said, we can... We can at start the date about 30 A.D. and it ends about 100 A.D. Um, there's one marker that uh, marks this church more than any other and that's the turning point of the early church, the end of the apostles. This was the last church that had an apostle as its leader. John was the last apostle to, to lead this church. When John died, the final apostle was gone, and for the first time, the church was, at, was without apostolic leadership. And in their, in their place, we had something far more important and powerful to lead the church, the word of God. So God knew what he was doing. People were relying on themselves more than they were relying on the Lord. So the Lord caused a lot of things to happen and then pretty soon they had to rely on nothing but the word of God. So the age that bridges the church from Christ's first coming to his second coming begins with the period of Ephesus. Okay? And then next week we'll move on to the, four, the third, second, third, and fourth periods of the churches. Okay? Are you totally confused? No? Good. I'm glad. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that your letters to churches 2,000 years removed still are relevant to us today. Lord, we can do a lot of things as a church in the 21st century, but if we lose our first love, then we've lost it all. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be diligent, to endure, to persevere, to hold on to what we have, to what you have given us, that this is your church and that you want it to grow and thrive. But Lord, we need to hold on to you first and foremost. Our thoughts and our minds and our words and our actions and our deeds need to be centered around the Word of God. It needs to be centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, help us as we continue on that you would just have your will and your way in our lives, that you would show us, Lord. And even as we continue reading, Lord, that we see things that uh, are appealing, some things may be appalling, but we know that uh, they're there for a reason. They're there to teach us. Your scripture says that everything that happened happened as an example for us. So Lord, let the examples touch our hearts and our lives and change us from the inside out. And we thank you and we be careful to give you all the praise. And we ask this in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.